Everything got quiet all of a sudden. Well, good afternoon and thank you all very much. I'm delighted to have all of you here and I understand that you've received extensive briefings from Secretaries Hodel and Regan, Dole and Weinberger, so you've already had an earful. And uh, I'll just add that I believe our economy is moving forward with strength and confidence. We've surmounted recession, built a recovery, and put America on the threshold of a lasting economic expansion. I'm sure you got all of that in the briefings that you've had so far. In 1981, we inherited an economy that nearly, well, it was nearly ruined by a nightmare of double-digit inflation, record interest rates, and over-regulation and taxation. And we set out to change course dramatically, and I think that we have started us in another direction. The growth of federal spending has been cut more than in half, and across the board tax rate reductions are providing new incentives for production, savings and risk taking, and deregulation of basic industries like banking and energy is sparking new competition. In addition, in the cutting of that, or eliminating of a great many of those regulations under the chairmanship of a, uh, George Bush and his task force, some amazing things have occurred. We estimate that we have reduced on the part of local governments and private individuals the amount of paperwork by some 300 million man hours a year. And uh, I've always wanted to see what would happen sometime if we in government just shut the doors and quietly slipped away to see who'd miss us. <laughs> But one example sums up the difference between the old policies of government pump priming and our approach that is based on trusting people. Last year, we were asked to support a $3.5 billion program that was meant to create make work jobs for 300,000 people. And we resisted that and that program didn't go into effect. We thought that economic recovery could do the job better. And so far, in the last 14 months, we have averaged putting more than 300,000 people to work every month. There are now 4 million more workers on the jobs than there were a little more than a year ago. I believe that we're beginning an industrial renaissance, which most experts never saw coming. It started with the 1978 capital gains tax reduction that was passed over the objections of many in government at that time and it was then made greater by our own tax cut program in 1981. Incentives laid the seeds for the great growth in venture capital which helped set off the revolution in high technology. Sunrise Industries from computers to fiber optics are creating a world of new opportunities. And as our knowledge expands, business investment is stimulated to modernize older industries with the newer technologies. We've seen the venture capital industry raised four times as much capital in 1983 as it did in 1980. And we've seen real fixed business investment increase by a 13% rate last year, the fastest of any recovery in the past 30 years. And we've seen funds raised in equity markets zoom from 17 billion in 1982 to 36 billion in 1983, and that is another record. Potential for growth New opportunities will be infinite if we marshal the power of incentives and human knowledge and transform our economy and reach toward our next frontier, which is space. This is why I take a very hard line to those who, in the name of reducing deficits, would raise taxes and risk sabotaging the recovery. Believing we can make more money available for individuals and businesses to borrow in the credit markets by taxing more money away from individuals and businesses is believing in what never was and never will be. The central problem our critics refuse to address is not the deficit alone, but government's total burden on the economy. Because whether government borrows or increases taxes to meet the deficit problem, it'll be taking the same amount of money from the private sector. The solution is to reduce that burden by bringing down government spending to a level where it cannot interfere with the economy's ability to grow. So we're pushing a constitutional amendment mandating a balanced federal budget 
a line-item veto to prevent pork barrel projects from slipping through as amendments to otherwise needed legislation, and speedy consideration of the Grace Commission's recommendations to reduce billions of dollars in wasteful spending and subsidies. We have those 2,478, I believe it is, recommendations from the Grace Committee, and we are now studying those as to how they can be implemented and whether they will take legislation or not. And incidentally, this, uh, this I, line item veto, I speak from experience. As governor of California, I had it, as do 43 governors today. And I, in my eight years out there, vetoed 943 spending items inserted into the budget after it had gone back to the legislature. And I had the right to veto them out. And when they had to face those particular items, all isolated, not part of a budget, and vote yes or no on them, I was never overridden on a single veto. I want line item veto as a president. And finally, we want to combine all these things we're talking about with another key reform, tax simplification, to make our economy the undisputed leader for innovation, growth, and opportunity. We can make taxes more fair, easier to understand, and we can greatly increase incentives by bringing personal tax rates down. If we can reduce personal tax rates as dramatically as we've reduced capital gains taxes, the underground economy will shrink, the whole world will be the path to our door, and no one will be able to hold America back. The real question America must face is not if we should work toward a balanced budget, but how. We can balance up by raising taxes, to accommodate higher and higher spending, but risk locking ourselves into economic bondage, or we can balance down by reducing spending growth and tax rates and permit our economy to break free. I believe that balancing down and breaking free is the true path toward declining deficits in an opportunity society, one that will offer a brighter future to all Americans. So, I've gone on long enough and perhaps longer than I should, but some of you perhaps have a question. Yes? Now I have to say yes, we've kept in very close touch and they are increasing the money supply within the bounds of the approach that they've set, the upper and lower limits, and right now it's about midway in there, and that path is commensurate with the growth in the economy. All we ask of them, and of course all we can do is ask because it is an independent agency, but all we ask is a money supply commensurate with our economic growth and one that will not uh, re-inspire uh, inflation to take off. possibility that this year uh, we will see a summit meeting with the new Communist uh, Party leader, Chernyenko, and yourself? <laughs> well, let me say, uh, this is one I can't really answer for you, because uh, relationships, are, they're very delicately balanced in so many ways. But let me say that um, I am supportive of the idea, and uh, we are in communication. We are in negotiations of a number of uh, things since this change to see if we cannot uh, enhance the relationship between our two countries. We've made it very plain to them that we know uh, neither one of us will ever agree with the other's uh, political philosophy, but we have to live in the world together. And we are the two nations that could guarantee peace to the world if we'll only get down to the business of doing it. over the administration's position.
position about the issue of technology transfer, you perceive it in that framework. I wonder if you could address some of your remarks to that subject. Well, we're believers in an open market, and yet, with regard to high technology, we have tried to set guidelines and rules that will keep us from giving away high technology that can then be used to strengthen possible adversaries against us. And um, that is particularly true with regard to the other superpower. But uh, that is all that we are trying to accomplish with that, and to the best of our ability, uh, retain a free, fair, and open market. That was. Um, no, wait a minute. This was this was on the merger, and uh, and I didn't get the last part. What? Uh, United States Steel is also planning to purchase National Steel. Uh, well, I have since I know that this is a legal matter now, and uh, that is being decided, and I have tried to keep quiet on it, but I don't mind telling you, I do not believe that such a merger would. Uh, reduce competition to the point that it would constitute monopoly at all. Where we're headed with regard to foreign policy in Central America. I hope we're headed directly down the line that was laid down by that bipartisan commission after they went down there for six months and studied the entire situation. I am very fearful of the attitude of some in Congress who can't see that that is in our best interest to see that we solve some of the economic and social problems of our Latin American neighbors, to eliminate those societies that are based on extreme wealth and then extreme poverty with no chance and opportunity for a middle class in between. And at the same time, to bring that about and those reforms about, we've got to give them security. You can't institute economic reforms uh, when the government in charge and the people are having their heads shot off by uh, rebels that are inspired by the Soviet Union and by Cuba. And we can use all the help we can get because those people in Congress that are trying to tell us that somehow we have no responsibility, no reason for being there. And if they can't look at the map and see what another Cuba geared to expansion down there in right here in our continent, what that means to us. One of our congressmen came back from talking to some of the Nicaraguan government officials. He had gone down there opposed to our viewpoint. He came back the other way around, and he told us that one of the officials in the Nicaraguan government had said to them, said to him, don't be surprised if in a year and a half you see us at the Arizona border. Now, huh? We heard him speak oh, <laughs> my golly, I didn't think anyone would remember that. Uh, hey. I wish Mac Baldrige were here. <laughs> I, uh, this has to do with, with uh, our machinery and sales overseas and... Yeah, uh, pending export Now, well, the only thing that I know about the restraint on export licenses has to do again with that same security matter of anything that would affect our national security by being in the wrong hands. Uh, that curbs getting a license. I don't know of any... Uh, difficulty with anything beyond that.
Yes, I think we're thinking back now to when with our European allies, uh, we were trying very hard to convince them that becoming customers and virtually totally dependent for energy on the Soviet Union uh, was a rather dangerous uh, way to be. And so this was one of the reasons why we were trying to discourage their partnership in that or their patronage of that proposed pipeline in the Soviet Union. Uh, then, as we went on with the summits, and uh, we finally were able to convince them to quit uh, providing things uh, and subsidizing uh, uh, purchase price and so forth uh, with the Soviet Union, and there was a relaxing, and this was the, and we have the creation of COCOM and the uh, the GATT treaties and all, and there was a relaxing of that. But there are still, I know, from our own cabinet discussions, there are still some items that we believe are uh, detrimental to us and to our security in that in that entire field. Uh, one last question, Mr. What? I'm being told I can only have one more, and I know, oh, I'm sorry. Well, this was one of the things we got some agreement on with them in what's called COCOM. That uh, finally, and this was where we relaxed some, when they agreed that there would be restraints on their part also. Now, maybe they're not as complete as we would like, but we can take com complaints to this body now that we formed with them, and hopefully we can act as allies together. And I, our relationship in that regard is far better than, than it was a few years ago when we were arguing about the, the pipeline. Uh, that's, that's all I can do. You have another appointment. Uh, well, I have to, I've just got to tell you one little experience here since the press, that fellow's ours, since the press, the other kinds of press isn't covering this thing. Not that I would resent this, but when I'm mentioning the summits that we've had, and these have proven to be quite an experience, the seven countries plus the head of the European Common Market that come together, and last year we came together at Williamsburg, this wonderful village of ours that has been restored to what it was like in colonial times. First meeting was to have dinner on the first evening in the British governor's colonial residence there. And so I was all set. I was going to open with uh, what I thought would be a kind of a leveler. And I was going to say to Margaret Thatcher, Margaret, you know, if one of your predecessors had been a little more clever, you would be hosting this gathering. <laughs> and gentlemen, never underestimate the ladies. I started with my line. I said, Margaret, if one of your predecessors had been a little more clever, she says, I know, I would have been hosting this gathering. <laughs> no. So I'll mind my tongue when I get to London for the summit this in June. Thank all you, right. Sir. Well, thank you all for being here. It's been a great pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Yeah.